So hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Caregiver series. Here today with us, we have Marianne, and I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Marianne Scott. I recently published a book called An Eight-Year Goodbye, which is about my father's eight-year battle with Alzheimer's disease. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction, and we can just get right into it. So my first question is, um, how long were you a caregiver for to your father? And if you feel comfortable, can you walk us through the diagnosis experience and what that was like for you guys in the beginning? Yes. Yeah, so I was a caregiver for eight years. He was diagnosed when he was 86. So I think that was in 2000. Hmm, he died in 2014. So it was like 2006. Um, he was diagnosed, we started noticing he was repeating himself, he was very paranoid, he was forgetting to take a shower, um, things that just didn't seem right. My father was very, very mechanically inclined. If something was broken, he could take it apart and fix it. We were noticing that he was unable to do the simplest things that he could do without even thinking before. Um, so I talked to my brother and I said, are you noticing some strange things about dad? And he said, yeah. So we took him to a neurologist. They gave him something called a mini mental state exam, uh, where they ask him basic questions. What's your name? How old are you? Where do you live? He was doing really good answering these questions until we got to, you know, well, how old are you? And he was 86 at the time. And he said 49. And we sat there like, Oh my gosh, what just happened? What year is it? He said 1954. Um, what season is it? It was clearly summer. We were dressed in shorts and t-shirts. He said winter. So we started thinking, oh my gosh, something is seriously wrong. So the doctor scored the test afterward. It's out of 30 points. He scored 20, which is considered mild to moderate Alzheimer's. So he diagnosed him with Alzheimer's disease. I had no idea what Alzheimer's disease was at that time. I had never known anyone that had it. I didn't know anything about it. I ran after the doctor so my father wouldn't hear and said, what does that mean? And he explained what that means. It just, it's a slow progressive cognitive de decline and told us what was gonna be down the road for us. So it was devastating, devastating. So that started our eight years of caregiving and, you know, just everything that we had to put in place for him as the disease progressed. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that experience, I can imagine. Um, so I guess to lead into my second question, um, what were some of the most challenging aspects of being a caregiver, especially transitioning to that right, right at the beginning? And what were some ways that you used to manage your tasks um, throughout the progression of the disease? So one of the worst things about it that I have to tell any caregiver is the guilt. Um, sorry. The guilt of getting impatient with them, um, of not understanding why they're saying and doing the things they're doing, and just feeling like you're not doing enough um, it's just so hard to understand how this person who was just amazing and could do anything is all of a sudden not able to tie their shoes. Um, it's just, and you look at them like, what, what is going on? Or they ask you a question and you answer it and you're having this great conversation. And five minutes later, they ask you that same question again. So you answer it again. And then five minutes later, they ask you again. And so you're trying to keep your patience, but then you start saying, dad, we already talked about that. And then he looks crestfallen and you feel so guilty because you just lost your patience. So then it's like a vicious cycle. You just swear you're not gonna do that next time. And then the next time it's, it happens again. So I guess my main piece of advice to caregivers is give yourself a break. It is a hard road, hard, very hard. Um, so anyway, putting things in place, what I did was I started realizing that I was losing it and I couldn't do this on my own. My brother was, and I did it together, but I started realizing that we couldn't do it on our own. We needed to bring people in. So we had other caregivers come in that could be there with him. I, there were times when I realized that I needed a break from him. So I would call one of the caregivers and say, could you go today instead of me or call my brother? 
take a little break, regroup, do something for myself. And then I could go back feeling refreshed and okay, I got this again. Um, so you have to reach out, you have to find support. I, I went to support groups, um, you know, did research whenever I could. So those are the things that you have to, as a caregiver, you have to do. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. The support groups are a big, big help. And even just asking for help. I think a lot of caregivers don't realize that asking help is such a big thing. Like oh, yeah. meeting what you're feeling and getting those things out. Um, I guess that really leads in great to my next question, which is about self-care. Um, what do you think is the importance of self-care to you and to other caregivers? And maybe can you break down the kind of self-care routine that you have for yourself? Yes, yeah, so I actually have a chapter in my book called Caregiver Burnout. Um, I started researching caregiver burnout to see if I had it. I had every symptom of it. Um, I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I was drinking too much. I was withdrawing from people. I didn't want to be around anyone. Um, so I started seeing a therapist. Um, she told me, you have to start taking time for yourself. You cannot continue to care for your father if you're not caring for yourself first. So I, she said, what kinds of things do you like to do? I used to be a runner. So she said, start running again. So I started running. Um, I would just sit outside in the sunshine. I would read a book for pleasure instead of reading books on Alzheimer's so that I could figure out what was going on. Um, again, just took a break from my dad because I thought, you know, I, I, I needed to pull back a little bit because I'm not doing him any good when I'm in this condition. Um, so you just have to find something that you love to do and you have to say, it's okay for me to take care of me first. I will still be there for him or her, but I need to care for me or I'm not going to be there for him or her. Um, I was going down a very bad path. I was getting to the point where I just couldn't cope anymore. I was at one point suicidal. Um, so you really have to pull back and say, I need to take care of me. So whatever, find something that you love to do, something that makes you happy and try to do that for yourself, even if it's just a little bit every day, but you have to try to find that for yourself. Definitely, especially the part about incorporating it daily. I think that's really, really great advice. Yeah. And so then leading back into your book, um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, what inspired you, what the process looks like and how it can support other caregivers? and where people can find it and buy it. Sure, so actually I'll show you. It's called An Eight Year Goodbye, a memoir, and it says, Our Family's Journey on the Path of Alzheimer's Disease. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my cover. So my father grew up on a farm. So I drove around trying to find a farm that would look great. Um, so I found this one and I did this sunset because I thought that was symbolic of the end of his life. Um, and he had a horse, so I thought I'd put a horse on there. So um, I started, what happened was I, after my father died, again, the guilt started coming in about, you know, did I do enough? I was impatient. I, whatever. So I started seeing another therapist and she said, this was a couple of years after my dad died. She said, you are suffering from PTSD. And I said, that's a, you mean, that's what soldiers suffer from when, when they come back from war. And she said, yes, but just like a soldier going through battle, when you were doing the eight years of caregiving, you did not have time to stop and think about what you were doing. You just had to keep fighting the battle every day. After the battle's over is when all the feelings come crashing down, the guilt, the anger, the bitterness, the despair. So she said, I think you should start writing down your feelings, just get them out. So I started writing and I just, you know, just started writing about how I was feeling and some of the things that happened. And I thought, wow, I wonder if I could turn this into a book, if this would be helpful to anyone. And then a couple of my friends started going through it with their own parents and started turning to me for advice. And one of my friends said, you should write a book. So I said, you know what, actually, I did start writing. So I thought I'm going to turn this into a book because if it can help one person that's feeling that despair, if they can read this and say, wow, that's how I'm feeling then I'll feel like I made a difference. So that was my main goal for writing it. I also wanted people to know about my dad, this wonderful man that was my dad. Many people that suffer from Alzheimer's, they their personality changes, they get angry, they get combative. 
I've heard so many people say that their parent got that way. My dad was the kindest man up until the very end. He was very appreciative of everything that anyone did for him. He was just this wonderful, wonderful man. And I feel like, you know, he had this horrible disease that was taking so much from him, but it didn't take the essence of this wonderful man. So he actually won this battle. Thank you. That was a really beautiful description. And I love the cover. I think so much thought went behind it. Oh, um, thank well, you. Thank <laughs> no you. Problem. And actually, you had asked me where you can buy it. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. Um, I think Google Play, iTunes. And I'm trying to get it in some local bookstores. Well, Barnes and Noble near me is going to carry it. So I don't know if I can get it you know, into other Barnes and Noble stores, but I would love to do that. Perfect. And we'll definitely throw the name and everything in the description of the video and that way people can refer back to it. Okay, um, great. Thank you so much for that description. And those were my questions. I'm just going to throw it over to Tana now who's going to continue. Okay. That was such a touching story to hear. I honestly have goosebumps. Like I'm such an emotional person. So oh, okay, I, good. So you'll excuse my crying. <laughs> oh, oh, a hundred percent. I almost am crying. So okay. don't even worry about it. And also okay. I'm sorry if you hear the beeping. Oh no, I'm good. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I think it's also amazing that you managed to write that book. And I do think it will really help people as well. Like you, when you, you know, talk about your experience and people can relate, I think that's really special. Yeah. Um, but what I wanted to ask you is, uh, what are some of the biggest lessons you learned when you were a caregiver? Um, I think patience. Um, I haven't always been the most patient person. My kids will attest to that. <laughs> um, but I learned that with someone going through this, they don't want to be this way. They're not doing this on purpose. They're not doing this to aggravate you. They can't help it. So you have to be patient. You have to walk away, count to 10, you know, do whatever you can do to get a hold of yourself and not be impatient with them and to just show them love. They, that's all they want. They're scared. It's scary for them. Um, you just need to do whatever you can do to make them feel loved and still valuable. My main goal when my dad was going through this was to preserve his dignity. I wanted him to still have dignity and not feel like he was a burden. So we did everything we could to make him still feel like he was valuable. We would still say, dad, we need you to come and help with this. And he was right there to help us. We would ask his opinion on things, even though sometimes it made no sense, but it just still made him feel like he was valuable. So that's one of the main things I definitely learned as a caregiver. You need to definitely make that person feel loved and cared for. That's amazing. And I agree. I think that's very important. And I think people probably underestimate the importance of that. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay. And then my next question is kind of about the support resources and tools that you use during the process. Did you find that there was something that was very helpful and that you would recommend to others? Yes. So I reached out to the Alzheimer's Association. They had a list of caregiving groups in my area. So I looked up um, some different caregiving groups. Now, the problem that my brother and I had was, so my father was a lot older when he had my brother and I. So when he was, you know, in his eight, late 80s, 90s, we were in our 50s. We were going to these support groups and a lot of the people that were going through it were older than us. They were going through it with their parent and their, so we couldn't relate. Like they didn't have the same things that we had. I had children I was still caring for. Um, I was working. A lot of these people were retired taking care of their parents. So I didn't feel, it, it was very, very beneficial to hear other people talking about it, but I needed other children of Alzheimer's people. So, you know, Alzheimer's patients. So I was having a hard time finding a good support group for that. Um, but support groups are wonderful. I mean, just to talk to somebody that was experienced the same emotions. Um, again, Alzheimer's Association. I read anything I could get my hands on about Alzheimer's. So I definitely recommend that as a support. You need to read. You need to find out what this horrible disease is. Um, and your friends and your family, when they're offering to help, take them up on it. You know, so many people said, let me do something for you. And I was like, no, 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 I have it. But, you know, there are times where you really do need help. You need someone to just come over and cut your grass or 
do something because you're trying to juggle all these things, especially if you are in that sandwich generation where you are caring for your parent and your children, um, you definitely need help. That's hard. That's really hard. So any kind of support you can get from friends, family, take them up on it if they're offering. That's really great advice for sure. And hearing, you know, the struggle balancing caring for parents and your children is definitely yeah. a hard one for sure. Yeah. Um, and then that also leads me into my next question, which is more about technology being a resource. Did you find that um, technology really helped in your caregiving experience or played some sort of role in that? I did. So again, being that I'm a little bit older, I go to books first. So I did go to the library, looked up books, but I did get online, Googled a lot about Alzheimer's. I think that's one of the reasons that I really wrote the book too, because everything I was finding was telling me about the physiological parts of Alzheimer's. You know, this is what happens to the brain, the plaque and all that. That's great. I want to know when they repeat themselves or when they ask something that makes no sense, should I correct him? Should I let it go? Should I pretend that it made sense? Like I needed somebody to tell me that, not the not the physiological parts of it. So I, um, when I did Google stuff, I did find a lot about this is what happens to the brain. I, so it wasn't really helping me that way. But I did turn to technology to look up a lot and to look up books. And then I would go to the library or I'd buy a book or, um, you know, to try to read a little bit more about it. So yes, I did turn to technology. Yeah, I guess it's kind of dependent on when you were a caregiver as well, because now obviously there's so many other resources available, like, for example, applications and, you know, online support groups, maybe and things like that. Exactly, right? because you figure my dad's been gone seven years and he was dealing with this for eight years. So you're talking like 15 years ago that we started this process. Um, so technology wasn't what it is now. Um, but now if I was going through it, yes, maybe I know that since I've gotten on Instagram and looked up different things about Alzheimer's, there are so many groups and some of the people that I'm following, ah, oh, I, I wish I would have had that resource to just be able to follow someone else going through it and say, wow, yeah, look, she's dealing with this too. I've messaged a couple of people that are dealing with it with their own fathers and said, you know, my heart is going out to you. I know what you're going through. So that support is wonderful. That's so lovely to hear for sure, because I think that's what's great about social media. It really brings people together and allows everyone to share their experience. Yes, yes. I actually, there's a woman that I just um, connected with on Instagram that is writing a book about her father's battle with Alzheimer's. So I said, if you need any help on how to do that, you know, I'm available. So I'm at least able to help her that way. Yeah, I think that's honestly great. Like, I think so many people connect that way. And we've definitely heard that from other caregivers as well. Um, so that's really great to hear. And then uh, that kind of also leads into the next question. Just we just kind of wanted to know um, if you had a chance to download our app and just kind of see what you thought of it. I did. And uh, the very first thing I thought when I downloaded it was why didn't wasn't this available to me when I was going through it? I mean, oh my gosh, it would have been so helpful to me. I, I wouldn't have felt so alone because it is a very lonely battle. And when I looked at that and saw what you guys do, I thought, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Like if you're feeling alone, there's some place to turn. You know, when you're feeling suicidal or you're feeling like, I can't do this by myself anymore. There's somewhere to turn. So what you guys are doing, wonderful, wonderful. So glad to hear that. That's that's really great feedback. Um, yeah, like uh, whenever, so, whenever a caregiver says that, that's basically all we wanna hear. And what we're trying to do is really help out and um, add a potential resource that maybe isn't there otherwise. Yeah, and it's a wonderful resource, wonderful. Because even I, you know, the other night I couldn't sleep, I forget, and I'm looking on my phone, like just to have that available in the middle of the night when you feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know where to turn. You know, again, something like that wasn't available to me 15 years ago when I would wake up in the middle of the night and think, do we put him in assisted living? Do we do we keep him in his home? I, I don't, let me talk to somebody and see what someone else feels. So to be able to go into something like that and have someone else say, this is what we're doing, or, you know, just somebody to give you advice when you're feeling so alone. It, 
wonderful resource. Um, and uh, also actually just to add to all of that, is there something that you would change about the application? Like, is there something that you think that we could approve upon? Because we also really value the feedback of caregivers as well. You know what, I actually want to look at it a little bit more. I have looked at it, but I haven't gone into depth about it. I definitely want to do that. But I, to me, the fact that I mean, do, do you have someone that, like I just said, in the middle of the night, if I reach out to someone and I am like, I'm losing it, is there someone that would be able to get back with me within a few hours or whatever to say, what do you need? We're here for support. Because I think that is the number one thing. When you're feeling like that, like, where do I turn? You want to know that someone is going to be re respond to you and help you because you just feel like I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. I think that's definitely something we would integrate in the future and in the near future as well to have that support for the caregiver more so just because right now the way the app works, sorry, excuse the sound. Um, right now it. the way, oh, you can't hear it? No. Oh, that's so great. To, that's so great no, to hear you, because you, I really uh, didn't want. Okay, no. great. Um, yeah, so right now it's more so the connection between the caregiver and the care receiver um, so the support is kind of for both, but on the side of even further supporting the caregiver, I think that's something we would definitely be looking into in the near future. So it's great to also hear that feedback. Yeah. And um, again, I don't necessarily mean, you know, if somebody's going on at two o'clock in the morning, they have to have a response, but just that someone will get back to you and, and you'll know that someone is going to get back to you with something just you know we know what you're going through or how can we help you just that feeling of being so alone and not having anywhere to turn so that is incredible that there is an app that someone can turn to for that and i i will definitely anybody that i know that's going through it i will definitely tell them about it thank you so much we really appreciate that and we're glad that you see it as a helpful resource oh, as well very much so it was so, so, so great to meet you. Uh, oh, we really enjoyed too. hearing, thank you. We really enjoyed hearing your experience and thank you for taking the time out of your day to speak with us. Um, we're really excited to also, uh, I guess, show people about your book and hopefully they also will um, think of that as a resource and look into that. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. It was so great to meet both of you. It, will I be able to go on the app and see what we talked about or how does that work? So um, on the app, you won't be able to see it, but what oh. we do is we share the interview on YouTube um, oh. and we post little clips on Instagram, if that's all right with you as well. And oh, we can tag yeah. you. Oh, that would be great. Okay, wonderful. And I actually have someone right now that I know that will benefit from your app. So I'm actually going to, as soon as we get off, I'm going to send it to them, have them use it because yeah, they're going through it with their mother and it's been like three or four years and she's She's at the end of her rope. So she just is feeling like, I, I don't know what more to do. So she will definitely benefit from your app. Awesome, thank you so much. And thanks for participating in our caregiver interviews. Uh, stay tuned for our next one as well. And um, you can catch our whole caregiver series on YouTube. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much.